Well, welcome back to Module 13 of the Series 6566 series from Series 7 Specialists. Again, I'm Dan Mars. We're real glad to have you here and I uh, hope you're getting a lot out of this. Hope you'll tell your buddies, hope you'll, really hope you'll tell your training department uh, and your licensing officers uh, about the availability of this resource. Uh, we really are trying to uh, just no holds barred, give you the full uh, complement of everything that you need to pass the test. So uh, keep in touch with us, let us know. Let's go ahead and dive in though because uh, we've got a ton of stuff still to cover. All right, the administrator's authority to deny, suspend, or revoke registration of securities stuff. We looked at the, the people uh, in the last module. It's going to be very, very similar. Are we surprised by that next line over on page 21? The administrator may issue a stop order if it's in the public interest and exactly the same thing as we saw with people. All right, so uh, the if the registration statement is materially incomplete or misleading, just like my or my business's registration statement, the registration statement for my, my stock, my bonds, my whatever it is I'm bringing public, that has to be complete and, and not misleading. If the act has been violated. Now, you know, one of the worst things that we've got is that uh, the, the, a lot of these things are Ponzi schemes. I mean, that's what you see. If you go and you know do a little bit of research, I, I wouldn't because it's really not worth it. But uh, but most of the violations that you see are either people just fail to to to, to realize that there there's paper that needs to be done, and uh, and they kind of step over the line unwittingly, or they've got a hugely bad idea. But by far and away, most of them are Ponzi schemes. Okay, that's that's where you deal the most, and so if fraud is going to be against every securities law in the books. So if if you're running a Ponzi scheme, it doesn't matter if you filed a registration statement. If the act's been violated, it's going to get revoked. If you're saying, well, you know, I tell you what, I want to become a crack dealer, but you know what, I tell you what, I'll, I'll get a license to sell crack. Well, that's not happening. <laughs> you, know, you can't get a license to, to, to do something illegal. So it's, it's the same thing here. Just you know, use a little bit of common sense, and they, they really do make sense. So anyway, if the act's been violated, if the security would work a fraud on the investing public, exactly what we've talked about, the administrator looks at it and says, I saw this back, you know, back in 2003, and people just got ripped off unbelievably. I'm not going to approve. I'm not going to let them sell that security. Uh, the, if the terms allow for unreasonable underwriter compensation. Now, let's take a second look at this one, okay? Because this is something that, it, it happens. And in fact, uh, from time to time, there are some unscrupulous promoters that will, they'll suck people in. All right? Here's the deal. I'm the issuer. And I'm basically a crook. All right. So what I do is that, that I, I, I bring in some agents to, to help me sell stuff to the public. Now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to, it, it, all, everything's going this way so far. Remember, money comes back this way. Some of it drops out here and some of it goes right here. And what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to sky with the money and get out of town. I'm just going to steal it. Now, if I'm paying somebody 5%, 7%, even 10% maybe, you know, depending on the circumstances, if I'm paying them a reasonable compensation rate, then on the surface of that, that's good. But you know what you're going to get into is that this guy right here, if he sees something that's fishy, he's going to say, hey, administrator, uh, something's going on here that you need to know about. I, uh, something's, it's just all wrong. And boom, it blows up the whole thing. But you know what? If I give these people 40%, you know what that is now? It's hush money for crying out loud. That's what it is. Well, you know, it doesn't look exactly right, but for crying out yeah, I'm, I'm getting 40% on it, so maybe I better just keep my mouth shut. If this is me, I'll take 60 cents on the dollar of free money that I'm going to steal anyway, 
Yeah, unreasonable underwriter compensation because it sets up that situation right there. I mean, that's the whole story right there. It's not that the administrator doesn't want you to make an honest living. Yeah, do it, but make sure that it's an honest living and don't take hush money. So, and, and you know, really, honestly, watch out if, if somebody approaches you because it has, it's happened in the past. And you know who got in trouble the most? These guys right here. Because they tried to be honest, but they just, they just didn't, they weren't circumspect. All right? Be circumspect. That's just, that's not on the test. But gosh, I tell you what, I hate to see people, you know, just fall for something like that. All right, and obviously if fees have not been paid, uh, they aren't going to start the right. Okay, so the administrator cannot deny due process of law, prior notification, opportunity for a hearing, written findings of fact, conclusions of law, same things we saw on individuals. It's exactly the same. All right, now, exempt securities. Again, we're, what are we talking about with the exemption? Number one, these things are securities. There's no doubt about it. But they're exempt. The certain rules don't apply. Which rules? Never, 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 never does an anti-fraud rule apply to any security or any transaction. If there's fraud in that security or that transaction, it's against the law. It, fraud is never okay. All right, so advertising and filing requirements, yeah, that's, that's where we can grant an exemption. But, uh, but like I say, never anti-fraud provisions. We had a, a sentence that we talked about with the 33 Act, a government regulator's list of charities is short, and we saw where there were there was uh, there were certain meanings to those, and that's how we did how we're able to remember them. You've got the same sentence here, except that you have certain uh, differences between the two. Now, this is where it, it's really important to know those differences. Again, if I were a test writer, I would just pound the heck out of those differences between federal and state law. So let's go ahead and go back to our old friend, a government regulators list. Oh, hello. The word list has a meaning here, okay, at the state level. At federal level, it's just kind of transitional of charities Short. Lots of similarities, lots of differences. Let's start looking at them, okay? If we have a governmental entity, so your treasuries, your agencies, your municipals, except that if it's an intrastate municipal, that the administrator can in fact deem that it needs a registration statement. Now, it probably won't, but it can. He or she can. And Canada and governments with which, I'm just going to put foreign, abbreviated here, governments, with which the United States maintains diplomatic relations. So let's look at this, okay? First of all, who was it that put forth the Uniform Securities Act template? It was the North American Securities Administrator. I have to stop and think about it every time. North American Securities Administrators Association, NASAA, all right? North American being defined as the Red River up. Canada is the Red River up. Okay, Red River. I'm sorry, folks in Texas. I didn't even go to OU, all right? Got nothing against you. The Rio Grande up. I do that every time. One of these days, I'm going to get my geography down. Give me a, give me a break, okay? Uh, but in any event, uh, yeah, so Texas, you're included in this. You're, you're like I say, uh, I, I, I'm a golden hurricane, not a sooner. Anyway, but, uh, but Canadian municipal bonds are exempt in this state, in the United States, because it's part of North America. Canadian uh, municipals are. Canadian uh, treasury securities are. All right. So, City of Montreal, their general obligations, yes, they're exempt. 
But what about going the other way? The Rio Grande, I'll get it right this time, the Rio Grande South. We maintain diplomatic relations with the government of Mexico. So Mexican treasury securities are exempt at the state level. But do we maintain diplomatic relations with Mexico City? No. Therefore, the bonds for Mexico City's public schools are non-exempt. They'll have to go through registration in this state. French bonds? Exempt. City of Paris bonds? Non-exempt. Okay? So that's where we get to that, and it's a very important, very good chance you'll see a question on that. Okay, so regulator, if there's a regulator in 1933 or, uh, or sometime subsequent to that. So what did we have? We had our old buddy Banks, okay? okay. Insurance and um, uh, 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 then we have um, yeah, insurance, com insurance companies, um, common carriers, Talked about these on the federal law. And then there, there comes a difference here because this next point, uh, public utility commissions or PUCs, anything that's governed by a PUC, just like the federal government took a big knife and carved out in investment companies, a different law, they took a big knife and carved out public utilities. So anything that's regulated by a public utility commission or PUC is going to be exempt at the state level because it's the domain of the federal government. They took specific jurisdiction over those public utilities. And then also uh, we have a, a little note left on the next page that not SBICs or small business investment companies. In fact, SBICs and, and very small businesses like that a lot of times that's the meat and potatoes of who has to register at the state level. All right, so now, list. Uh, I'm actually going to come back to this, okay, because what we're referring to is just, I'm, I use that as a grouping for our federal covered securities. And I want to talk about federal covered securities. In fact, probably, uh, uh, yeah, we'll get to it on this module. But, uh, but we'll come back to that in a minute because I like to draw it out as well, okay? Uh, charities, same thing as the federal government, so you've got nonprofits, you have fraternal organizations, okay. and then short, like short term, just like we had with the um, uh, with the federal government, if it's short term, you know, less than 270 days. And you've got banker's acceptances, commercial paper. You do have a little twist on the commercial paper, okay? So uh, basically, here's what we've got. I want them to draw this out, and I'm starting to run out of room here where you can see me, and I want to draw this out. So let's go ahead and knock out that commercial paper real quick because there's a pretty easy way uh, to remember it, just making some, you know, some cheesy little stories and making some associations. Uh, basically, what we've got is that you have to have 50,000 or more okay, face value, so greater than 50,000, and in the top three grades. Now, there's a, there's a Christmas movie, and I'll be darned if I can remember the name of it, uh, but, uh, but basically it's one with Nicolas Cage and uh, Tia Leone, or however she pronounces her name. Uh, where you know, he's the, the big rainmaker guy. and Anyway, he's the last guy in the, the whole office building on Christmas Eve, uh, except for the security guard. So as he's going out, the, the exchange between them is, uh, you know, Merry Christmas, Mr. or whatever your character's name is. Uh, and, and he says, hey, Merry Christmas. And he, knows the, he knows the security guard by name. And he says, hey, I did what you told me to with that $5,000. Nicholas Cage gets a smug look on his face and says, Commercial paper? The guard goes, commercial paper. Nicholas Cage goes, but only till the D-Mark turns. You can tell how old a movie it is, okay? I don't know what the D-Mark has to do with commercial paper, but the thing about it is, that's absolutely absurd. It sounds great in a movie, but it's absurd. You're never, ever, ever going to find a $5,000 piece of commercial paper. You're just not going to do it. He should have just said, find a good money market fund. Yeah. 
You're never going to find a $5,000 chunk of commercial paper. You're not going to find a $50,000 chunk, but that's the minimum. Okay, it's $50,000. You're just not going to see it. Now, add a couple more zeros on there and let's start talking, okay? But $50,000? No, I don't think so. So quantitatively, everything you're going to see in the marketplace, you could conceivably see it at the state level, I guess. But everything you see in the marketplace is going to be exempt on a quantitative scale. What about qualitative? There are four grades. Okay? You've got uh, A1, P1. Oops, I'm going to write it out correctly here. You've got A1, P1, A2, P2, A3, P3, and then A4, NP, and this NP stands for not prime. Okay? Now, again, in the marketplace, qualitatively, all that you ever see are these top two grades. In fact, if you ever see a, a chart that tracks commercial paper rates, it's only going to have two lines on it because nobody would buy this stuff. But at the state level, in order to be exempt, it has to be in the top three groups. So this is what's, that's what's exempt, is the top three grades. So quantitatively or qualitatively, either one, everything you see in the marketplace is going to be exempt using those guidelines. Okay, so uh, anyway, that's the short and the little quirk that we have with commercial paper. Let's go back and pick up that, uh, that list exemption. And again, at the federal level, list is just kind of a transitional word. That's because what we're talking about here are, are securities that are specifically covered by the federal registration. Duh, that's why they call it federal covered securities. So let's look at the details on this, okay? If I have a security that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So, Procter & Gamble. They're huge. We all know them. They're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Their common stock is. Therefore, if Procter & Gamble issues some common stock, that common stock is going to be exempt at the state level. So, Procter & Gamble says, well, you know, that's all good and well, but we could issue some preferred stock, and it would be senior. Or we could issue some bonds. And even the most lowly little bond is going to be senior to the, the most senior preferred. Since these are actually senior to our, our common stock, shouldn't they likewise be exempt? So, eh, got a point there. Uh, Procter Gamble says, again, we probably won't do this. But we could conceivably issue some rights. Or we could conceivably issue some warrants. And one of these days, what they'll do is they'll turn into our common stock. Shouldn't they likewise be exempt? You got a good point. Okay? So if it's listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, some of the, the major regional exchanges, uh, then, then, or if it's senior to or equal to, then it's going to be exempt at the state level. It'll be a federal covered security. Along comes Microsoft. They say, you know, it's not that we can't get listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We just choose not to. Shouldn't we have the same set of exemptions? Well, makes sense, yeah. So, oh, all right, fine. If you're, if you're, if you're on the NASDAQ, okay, then the National Market System is the old name, the, the Global, Global Select, okay, then... Um, uh, equal to, senior to one of those, uh, then, then you're, uh, you're likewise going to be, um, uh, you're going to be on uh, the, the list of federal covered securities. Uh, and also if, uh, in fact, even now, uh, if you're, um, uh, like I say, global, global select, either one of those. Uh, here comes then a, um, uh, an investment company, open end or closed end, either one. In fact, a closed end could make a case, uh, we, we have, we're there already. But the open end says, you know, we don't trade. We always issue new stuff, and we then just redeem our shares once people cash them in. But the thing is, says the investment company, 
1940, the federal government took that big old knife and it carved out, specifically carved out investment companies. Shouldn't we be in this? Well, yeah, you got a good point there. And so if it's an investment company, and you know, there are some closed-in companies that issue preferreds or some bonds, but they can do it, okay? So if it's an investment company, senior to, equal to their common, then it likewise is going to be exempt at the state level. It's going to be a federal covered security. Or if there's a security for which another federal exemption is available, and this is due to the preeminence of federal law, what that means, and this is the only place you're even going to have to mess with this is on the test, okay? What that means is that treasury securities, are they exempt at the state level because they're exempt securities or because they're federal covered securities? The answer is yes, both, both. There's a specific exemption for those at the federal level, therefore those are federal covered securities. And I know it's kind of weird. But if there's, a, if there's a, a separate exemption for something, then it becomes a federal covered security. All right, so that's our, our uh, like I said, our government, regulator. Now the list, charities, short. Okay, and those are our exempt paper, our exempt securities at the, at the state level. Make sure that you keep the difference between the state and federal. That's, I just can't overemphasize that, not only on this, but on any, any type of regulation at all, okay? And we've kind of hit a breaking point, so let's go ahead and shut this one down. We'll come back then and pick up exempt transactions in the next module. We'll see you in a little bit.